the Lord. Last Sunday was the grand finale of Jubilee Crusade 2024. It was a week-long um, crusade of intense activities. And last Sunday, if I'm not mistaken, this auditorium was filled. Praise the Lord. We tried the little we could in the area of preparation. But the truth must be spoken. It was the Lord that performed everything. And so I don't think it would be out of place for us to just take about two minutes to return all the glory to him for what he did. I trust that Jubilee Crusade 2025, if the Lord tarries, is going to be three times, four times, ten times greater than Jubilee Crusade 2024 in Jesus' name. Can you please just rise with me and let's appreciate the Lord. I want us to take this song. It's a song of praise. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. So our precious heavenly father we give you all glory we give you all honor we give you all adoration for jubilee crusade 2024 we thank you for how you started with us we thank you for how you continued with us we thank you for how you completed and perfected it you were all that mattered you made all the difference as a church as individuals lord we appreciate you we bow and tremble at the wonderful things that you did. We thank you, Lord, for the salvation of souls. We thank you for deliverances. We thank you for healings. We thank you because the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are unseen are eternal. We thank you for the eternal things that you have done. We ask you will receive all our glory and praise in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, today, as we wrap up, we ask, Lord, you will speak to us what you want us to hear. You open our hearts to connect with your heart in the mighty name of Jesus. Magnify your word and make it honorable. For in Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Praise the Lord. As announced, the topic of 
our exhortation this morning is that our fruit may abide. That our fruit may abide. We thank the Lord for Jubilee Crusade 2024. Of a truth, it was a time of refreshing in God's presence. And we thank God for granting us the grace to prepare for the program as a church, to participate in the program, and to partake of the blessings. It's my prayer that our blessings as individuals and as a church will endure in Jesus' name. We are particularly grateful to God that souls were saved during the program for the three days of the main crusade sessions friday the 9th saturday the 10th and sunday the 11th of february we saw men we saw women we saw youths we saw children responding to the call to give their lives to jesus christ it is the Lord that draws. It is the Lord that attracts. It is the Lord that saves. It is not by the gimmicks of any man or by trickery or by, you know, by anything. It is the Lord that saves. And anytime we see people responding to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, we should know that the Lord has been at work. And it's my prayer that all the souls saved, all the souls restored, all the souls refreshed during Jubilee Crusade 2024 will abide and endure in the mighty name of Jesus. I was particularly glad on Monday last week, that was uh, the 12th, when in the evening we gathered to do a small reception for those who gave their lives to Christ during the crusade. We used the Covenant Chapel there. We started the program by 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock, 5.15. And by 5.30, 5.45, I won't say I was surprised. But I was surprised because men, women, youth, children just started trooping in. And it was such a wonderful time. We announced on Sunday that those who gave their lives to Christ should come for a welcome reception. And they came. The Lord brought them. And it's our prayer that the Lord who brought them will also plant them in the church and in Christ in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, these precious souls are the greatest gains or the benefits of the program. It is not the signs, it is not the wonders, it is not the miracles, it is not the prayers, it is not the prophecies, it's not even the palliatives. The greatest gains, the greatest benefits of Jubilee Crusade 2024 are these souls, these precious souls that the Lord drew to himself. And so, within the space of time we have this morning, we want to talk about how to properly manage or nurture these ones under the topic that our fruits may abide. In the passage we read during the Bible reading, that's John chapter 15, verse 14 to 16. The Lord Jesus made it very, very clear that we, his disciples, that we are not just mere servants. He said that we are his friends. And there's a difference in being a servant and being a friend. The relationship of friendship is deeper, is stronger, is richer. And so the Lord made it abundantly clear that as his followers, as believers, 
as the people of God, we are his friends. And as, as his friends, we have a special status. And what is that status? That we have been called, we have been chosen, we have been ordained to bear fruit. And not just to bear fruit, but that our fruit should remain or abide. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Apostle Peter, amplifying this profound truth of our status as the chosen people of God, as the appointed people of God, said, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show for the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So as a church of God, we show forth the praises of Jesus who has chosen us by shining his light in the darkness of this world and by bearing fruits. As disciples, we are called and chosen to bear three kinds of fruits. The first kind of fruit we are called to bear is the fruit of good works or the fruit of the goodness of Jesus. We must have a testimony or a report of being good people. The goodness of Jesus must be seen in us. It must be evident. It must be manifest. I remember some few years ago when I gave my life to Christ. A very popular song, very lovable song we used to sing then, which we don't hear so much nowadays, but which reinforced this truth that Jesus, whom we represent, Jesus, whom we believe in, Jesus, whom we have come to, is good. Is this song? Everywhere he went, he was doing good. The mighty healer, he healed the lepers. When the crippled saw him, they started walking. Everywhere he went, my Lord was doing good. As people of Jesus, the first fruit that we are called and chosen to bear is the fruit of good works. Colossians chapter 1 verse 10 says, That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Jesus was a good man. And so, it is a contradiction for Jesus to be good. And for people who claim to know him, people who claim to follow him, people who claim to believe him, to be bad or to have a reputation of being bad. Jesus did no evil. Jesus did no wrong. Jesus did nothing bad. He did not deceive people. Even though there are many people who deceive in his name today. Jesus did not defraud people. Even though there are many people today, inside and outside the church, defrauding in his name. Jesus did not destroy lives. He did not destroy marriages. He did not destroy businesses. The only thing he destroyed were the works of the devil. And he did that in fulfillment of scripture because the Bible says, for this reason, the Son of Man was made manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Therefore, as Christians, as believers, as the church of God, the body of Christ, we must bear the fruit of good works. The second fruit 
that we are called and chosen to bear is the fruit of the Spirit of God or the fruit of godly character. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. Against such, there is no law. That means that there is no restriction. There is no limit to how far you can manifest, you can exhibit, you can practice these things. It's boundless. There is no law restricting it. And that is the kind of fruit that we are called and chosen to bear. Because all these virtues were in Christ Jesus and they were boundless. They were measureless. They were immeasurable. And it is the divine expectation that as we grow in him, we also grow in all these things. Matthew chapter 7 verse 20, Jesus Christ said that by their fruits we shall know them. A good tree will only bring forth good fruits. A bad tree will only bring forth bad fruits. A good tree cannot bring forth bad fruits. A bad tree cannot bring forth good fruits. By their fruits you shall know them. By your fruits we shall know you. Mahatma Gandhi, that great Indian leader and nationalist, said something many years ago. I read it in a book and I've never forgotten. He was of the Hindu religion. And he was approached and asked, To give his life to Jesus. He said. I like Christ. But I dislike Christians. Because they do not live like Christ. Why? Because the fruit. Of godly character. He could not see in the Christians that surrounded him. Rather than godly fruits, what they brought forth were ungodly fruits. Hatred, malice, deception, wickedness of the basest sort, and every bad thing that you could think of. So he said, I like your Jesus, but I don't like you because you are not like your Jesus. May that not be our testimony in the mighty name of Jesus. The third fruit that we are called to bear is the fruit of soul winning or the fruit of evangelism. And that is what we are going to dwell on briefly this morning. Romans chapter 1 verse 13 said, Now, I will not have you ignorant brethren, that oftentimes I proposed to come unto you, but was let it at all that I might have some fruit among you, among you also, even as among other Gentiles. This was Apostle Paul speaking to the Christians in Rome. Before he wrote this letter to them, he had been to several places to preach the gospel. And people had given their lives, they had surrendered their lives to Christ. He had been to cities, he had been to towns, he had been to villages. He had risked his life for the cause of the gospel and with results. And he was telling the Roman Christians here that just as I did in other places, it's also my longing, it's also my desire that I should come to you and I should also what? I should also have fruit amongst you. What did he mean by fruit? He was talking about converts. He was talking about people who would give their lives to Christ. And he was talking about that happening 
in the capital of the then world, the Roman Empire, Rome itself. And eventually God granted that prayer because eventually he ended in Rome. And he was able to preach the gospel and he was able to have fruit. May the Lord also anoint each and every one of us to bear fruit in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, the third fruit, this fruit of soul winning or evangelism is a fruit that we bear whenever as a church or as individuals we step out boldly and obediently to preach the gospel as commanded by the Lord. We know that we have a great commission as believers. There is a charge entrusted to us by the Lord. And that is in Mark chapter 16 verse 15 to 16 and 20. Jesus said to his disciples, he said, and he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. Look at verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord walking with them and confirming the word with signs following. So every time we obey the instruction or the command of the Lord to go forth, whether as individuals or as a church, to proclaim the gospel that Jesus saves, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that Jesus is the deliverer, that Jesus is the helper, that Jesus is the repairer and the maker of destinies. And we tell people everything that Jesus stands for, everything that Jesus represents, everything that Jesus died for, there is bound to be a response. Because the Lord is always there to back his word, to back the gospel with signs and wonders following. But may I say this, that many times where we fail to bear the first fruit, the fruit of good works. When we fail to bear the second fruit, the fruit of godly character, this could be a barrier. It could be a great hindrance to the bearing of the third fruit. That is why it is possible for us to prepare for a program, to prepare for a crusade, to prepare for evangelism. And when you go to invite people and you tell them, please, I want you to come for this program. I want you to give your life to Jesus Christ. And they will say, if this is what giving one's life to Jesus Christ is all about, with what I know about you, it is better I remain the way I am. Or if the way they live in that your church or what they practice in your church is what Christianity represents. I don't want any of it. What makes such things to happen? It is simply because of failure or barrenness to produce the first and the second fruits. I pray this morning that the grace to be fruitful all round, the Lord will give to each and every one of us in the mighty name of Jesus. But it's an aberration. It's an anomaly to bear the first two fruits and not bear the third one. So, when as a Christian, you are known for good works. You are known as Mr. Nice Guy, Mrs. Nice Woman. You are known as a man of honest reports. You are, known, you are known as a woman of honest reputation. But that does not translate to bringing forth fruit or souls to the Lord, there's something that is wrong. If you, bring, you are bringing forth the second fruit, you show love, you manifest joy, peace, you are patient, you are, you know, you are temperate, you are self-control, all the fruit of the Spirit are complete in you. But it does not translate to drawing people to Jesus, 
to causing men, women, young and old, to surrender their lives to Jesus Christ, it is not normal. It is possible for us to have these two fruits, and yet we fail to bear this third fruit because it is not automatic. Can, I help you? Can you help me tell the person by your side? Bearing the fruit of God, the gospel. Bearing the fruit of evangelism. Bearing the fruit of soul winning. Is not automatic. It's 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 not automatic. Because Mark chapter 16, verse 10, 20, Oshiojua, to the important things that will cause us to be fruitful in the area of soul winning. Can it be projected? And I want us to read it together. Mark chapter 16, verse 20. Can we read it together, please, as a church? And they went forth. And preached everywhere. The Lord walking with them and confirming the word with signs following. One verse, but power packed. The first thing is that we cannot bear fruit of evangelism and so winning if we do not preach. We must preach the gospel, we must open our mouth, whether as individuals. Whether as a group, whether as a church, to tell people, to tell our family members, to tell our friends, to tell our neighbors, to tell our colleagues that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Jesus Christ saves. We must tell them that they need Jesus. The apostles went forth and they preached everywhere. Hey, you're kidding to me everywhere. Everywhere means everywhere. It means that there was no place they could not preach the gospel. As long as there was time, as long as there was opportunity, they seized it. To do what? To preach the gospel everywhere. At home, they preach the gospel. In the market, they preach the gospel. School, they preach the gospel. Office, they preach the gospel. Market, they preach the gospel. Everywhere, in the vehicles, they preach the gospel. In the villages, in the towns, everywhere they preach the gospel. They preach the gospel so much that they accuse them of turning the world upside down. But they didn't turn the world upside down. They turned the world right side up. They preach the gospel. That is the first thing. For us to bear fruit, we must preach the gospel. Number two. The presence of the Lord was there. If the Lord is not with us, as son you. The Bible says they went forth and preached everywhere, and the Lord walking with them. They were walking in partnership with God. And if we are going to bear fruit, fruit that we abide, the Lord must walk, the Lord must walk with us. What we saw during the Jubilee Crusade was just a tip of the iceberg of what the Lord could do for us, in us, and through us in the area of evangelism. And may it be a reality for us in the mighty name of Jesus. Number three, the power of God must be present. For, for the gospel to be impactful, for the gospel to hit home, for the gospel to produce fruits, there must be power. The Bible says that the kingdom of God is not in words, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. And when we are talking about power, we are not talking about demonic power. We are not talking about intellectual power. We are talking about raw spiritual power from heaven. We are talking about that power that is manifest in signs, in wonders, in miracles. And I want to know that the Jesus of the New Testament, the Jesus of the Bible, is still the Jesus of today. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Everything he did in Bible times, he can do, he is still doing, and he will do in the mighty name of Jesus. On the day of Pentecost, 
in Acts chapter 2 verse 1. After the disciples were baptized in the Holy Spirit, Peter, supported by the other apostles, preached the gospel openly in Jerusalem. When he started preaching the message, they were making jest of him. They were, making, they were mocking them. They said they were full of new wine. That look at these drunkards. This early in the morning, they are full of wine. But by the time the message progressed, and by the time the message ended, all the mockers had to bow to the lordship of Jesus. Why? Because the Bible says that God has given him a name, a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, and every tongue confess of things in heaven, of things on earth, and of things under the earth, that Jesus is Lord. To the glory of who? The glory of God the Father. That single ministration resulted in the conversion of 3,000 souls. One message, one man, 3,000. On another occasion, in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John, they were going for prayer meeting in the temple. And as they were about entering the temple, they saw a lame man at the gate. He has been lame from birth. He was born lame. He was a beggar. Everybody knew him. Very, very popular. Because you will always meet him at the gate asking for money. This day, he asked for arms, but he got more than what he asked for. Because when he asked for arms from Peter and John, Peter told him, he said, that silver or gold I don't have, but such as I have, I give unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And of course, the man got on his feet and started running. And everywhere scattered. And as people were gathering, before they could recover, Peter quickly mounted the rostrum and started preaching the gospel. He used it as an opportunity, as a platform to preach the gospel. And that day, 5,000 men, one man, one message, under the power of the Holy Spirit, 5,000 men responded to the gospel. They gave their lives to Jesus. That was besides women and children. Crusade got It has always been like that. As it was in the beginning, so it is now, and so it shall be. Imagine cast of a world without end. Praise the Lord. That was the impact of the gospel. So when we preach the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit, accompanied with miracles, signs, and wonders, people will believe and we will bear fruit abundantly. So, this message is, regardless of the souls that gave their, their lives to Jesus Christ during Jubilee Crusade, we can see much more. Conversions can be in hundreds. Conversions can be in thousands. Conversions can be in millions. As far as your eyes can see, the Lord can give you as a possession. Ryan Bonke said that I saw a blood-washed Africa. My question to you this morning is that what do you see? It is what you see. It is what we see that will determine what we will possess. And may the Lord help us to see rightly and see correctly in the mighty name of Jesus. Anytime souls come to the Lord, anytime people give their lives to Jesus Christ, the Bible says that there is joy, there is celebration in heaven. It is not the testimonies of prosperity or the testimonies of breakthrough or the testimonies of promotion that provokes joy and celebration in heaven. Yes, those things are the doings of the Lord. They are the Lord's doings. They are marvelous in our sight. But when it comes to the joy and the, you know, the joy and the elation the Lord derives from the salvation of souls, it surpasses all that. Luke chapter 15 verse 7. Jesus said, I say unto you that there shall be joy in heaven over one sinner that repents more than over 99 just persons which have no need of repentance. 
we shall bear fruit. You will bear fruit. I will bear fruit. But beyond bearing fruit of soul winning and evangelism, the Lord desires and expects that these fruits, that this converse should remain or abide. What does this mean? We are talking about that our fruit may abide. So what does it mean for fruit to abide? Number one, it means that these young converts, these young believers, they should last in the faith. They should not be lost. Number two, it means that they should stand in the faith and they should not fall. Number three, it means that they should be stable. Stable. They should stand. No, they should be stable in the faith. And they should not be, sh they should not be shaky. They should not wobble. Number four, it means that they should stay in the faith and they should not stray away. Number five, it means that they should be strong in the faith and they should not be weak. Number six, it means that they should not deny the faith or depart from the faith. And last but not the least, it means that they should stand in the love of Jesus Christ and should never be separated from the love of Christ. No matter the temptation, no matter the pressure, no matter the problems, no matter the challenges. That was what Apostle Paul was talking about in Romans when he said, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Is it tribulation? Is it trouble? Is it peril? Is it persecution? Is it poverty? Is it nakedness? Is it lack? He said, I have checked everything. I've checked everywhere. I'm convinced that there is nothing. I'm persuaded. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And to ensure that these fruits are not lost, that these fruits are not wasted, that these fruits are not, you know, these fruits abide, the Lord Jesus Christ gave a very clear instruction to his disciples. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. Please project it. Let's look at it together. The instruction he gave them to ensure that they are not lost. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, ever unto the end of the world. Amen. Join me to say amen. amen. Many times we mix up Matthew chapter 28 verse 18 to 20 with Mark chapter 16 verse 15 in Mark chapter 15 verse 16 Jesus Christ said go ye into all the world and preach in Matthew chapter 18 he said that go into all the world and teach all nations there is a difference between preaching and teaching preaching is proclaiming teaching is explaining and so, the difference between bearing fruit and having your fruits abide is in preaching and teaching. Preaching will produce fruits. Teaching will cause those fruits to abide. And that was why when Jesus Christ appeared to Peter at the Sea of Tiberias with the other disciples, three things he told Peter. He said, Peter, lovest thou me more than this? Feed my lamb. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. That's talking about taking care of the fruit. Taking care of the flock. In obedience to these instructions of the Lord, the disciples took concrete steps to ensure that the, conf that the converts were confirmed. You know, I talked about the converts, the fruits. First preaching, 3,000. Second preaching, 5,000. But because the disciples knew that Jesus Christ had told them that no man puts his hands on the plow and looks back, is fit for the kingdom of heaven. 
they know that it is worse for a man never to come to Jesus, not, never to have come to Jesus Christ, than to come to Jesus Christ and now go back to the world, and now go back, you know, into darkness, and now backslide. They did due diligence to ensure that these believers, these new believers, were nurtured. They were taken care of so that they did not fall back. How did they do this? Acts chapter 2, verse 41 to 47. Acts 2, 41 to 47. I want us to read together. Yes, let's read it together. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. And so their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as ever. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The first thing that the church did to ensure that the fruits remain was the teaching of the word of God. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. What was the apostles' doctrine? It was not fables. It was not folk tales. It was not riddles and jokes. It was the pure, undiluted word of God. What Jesus Christ taught them they ensure that these people were taught consistently, methodically, properly, and clearly. Colossians chapter 3 verse 16 says that let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with melody in your heart to the Lord. Excuse me. Fruit will abide. Fruit will remain when the word of Christ dwell in them richly. But the word will not get into them richly, will not get into them automatically if it is not taught. The essentials of the faith, the doctrines of the faith, the truth of the word of God must be taught deliberately, must be ta taught consistently, must be taught with examples and illustrations. It must not be theoretical. It must be practical. And that was what the early church did. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 13 says that, preach, it says that, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. As a church, as individuals, if our fruits must abide, we must give attendance to the reading of the scriptures. We must give attendance to exhortation. We must give attendance to doctrine. The Lord will help us in that regard in the mighty name of Jesus. Believers, young believers must be taught what they need to grow spiritually. What they need to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Motivational speaking will not do. Making people laugh and smile will not do. Because in the day of battle, in the evil days, those things will not stand the test of time. Those things will not avail. It is the word of God, the power of God that is in his word that opposes and sustains people when the going gets tough. It's what enables them to get going. May the Lord grant us the grace as a church to teach the apostles' doctrine in the mighty name of Jesus. We are living in days when the gospel of truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ has been compromised, has been diluted, even by unexpected people in unexpected quarters. But the Lord will grant us the grace to escape. We will stay true to the doctrine. We will stay true to the truth. And we will proclaim it boldly, courageously, fearlessly, wherever we get to, in the valley, on the mountain, in the, you know, by the seaside, wherever we get to, 
Because it is the only solution. It is what can cause people to be established in the faith. Number two, the thing they did, fellowshipping with the new believers. If you look at that, you know, that place we read, it says, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship. Praise the Lord. Breaking bread. Yes, no, no. Before 46, 41. Acts 2, 41. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. What is fellowship? Many years ago, somebody told me that fellowship means the fellows in the ship. Or the fellows in a boat. So when Jesus Christ and his disciples were together in a boat, what was that? That was fellowship. When the going was good, they were together. That was fellowship. Where there was a storm, when there was a tempest and, their, and their, their boat was almost capsizing, they were together. That was what? That was fellowship. When they tried all they could to bail the water out of the boat and they could not, and they had to quickly call Jesus to rescue, they had to communicate with him. That was what? That was communication. That was fellowship. Fellowship means more than us gathering together as a church because it is possible for us to gather together and not have fellowship. Fellowship means friendship. French fellowship means connection. Fellowship means association. Fellowship means, you know, having interactions. And that was also what the, the early church did. They continued steadfastly in fellowship. They associated with the new believers. They identified with them. They befriended them. They did not allow any distance or any, you know, they did not allow any distance or any disconnection to take place. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 says that we should not be in the habit of forsaking the assembling of one another. We should never forsake fellowship or break the bonds of fellowship. When we gave our lives to Christ, the devil had no chance. Those days when we gave our lives to Christ, the devil had no chance. You know why? Because once you say yes to the gospel, our Christians must shoot any. They will persecute you with visitation. Those days, there were no phones. Could see landlines, no one. Could see GSM. You can't send, you can't chat on WhatsApp. You can't send SMS. You can't do anything. But what they could not do with phones, they did with their legs. Tell you, come back to Wala Aro. Any can one your son. Any can one your role. One day, any barra one saw. And so it was just impossible for you as a young Christian not to survive. They persecuted, if you can use that word in quote, they persecuted with visitation, they persecuted with care, they persecuted with concern, they empathized, they sympathized, they were there. That was fellowship. And that was what happened in the early church. I need connection. My fathers, please forgive me. I will say this. I want to know that when we sit together, there's a spiritual current, there's a spiritual connection that takes place. When we sit apart, we don't sit together for what reason, I do not know. I want to know that it's actually breaking the bands of fellowship. In those days, when we didn't have the privilege of chairs like this, we sat on benches and pews. We will sit together until there was no space on the pew or the bench and some of us will stand and we did it joyfully what has happened to us may the lord help us in the mighty name of jesus in everything we should relate in everything we should connect in everything we should flow and when these people when these young ones when they see that we are truly we are truly in fellowship they will be encouraged they will survive they will stand. The devil will not be able to penetrate. And the Lord will be glorified in their lives in the mighty name of Jesus. Number three. They continue steadfastly in prayers. Adura to bono. Adura to mangeki le mi. To mangeki le mi. Adura agba. Agba lagun. Kishi adura agbefe. 
king shadra to tutu you remember that when after the miracle of that lame man the and 5000 people gave their lives to christ the Jewish leaders knew that there was a problem. They knew. Because from 120 disciples, suddenly that church grew from 120 to 3,120. Before anybody could say anything, they had increased by 5,000. They knew that there was a problem. They knew that their empire was under threat. And so they called them and said that, you must not preach in the name of Jesus again. You must not preach the gospel again. You must keep quiet. You must shut up. No evangelism again. No witnessing in this office. No witnessing anywhere. And the apostles told them, they said that, we cannot obey you. We must obey God. But when they left the place, the Bible says that they went back. The Bible says, and the whole place was what? Was shaking. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you know the meaning of that? For them to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's when they were already full of fear. Holy Spirit. Those who were already timid and having second thought about preaching the gospel, about continuing the faith. By the time they prayed, what happened? Holy Spirit. Fire. And so, if these disciples must stay, if they must stand, we must what? We must make sure we pray. We must pray for them. We must pray with them. We must pray privately. We must pray openly. We must pray secretly. We must pray persistently. We must pray over issues using Operation Push. Pray until something happens. And the thing that must happen must be what? Must be positive. Because since the day of John the Baptist and up to now, the kingdom of God has been advancing forcefully and the forceful lay hold of it. We must learn to be aggressive. We must learn to be violent in prayers. The kingdom suffers violence and the violent takes it by force. Lastly, what did they do to ensure that these ones who stood, remained? By providing for their welfare. Meeting their needs as the Lord enabled. The Bible says that people willingly, freely, because they saw the needs, the physical needs, the material needs. I want to be in pa. I want to be one in water. I want to get one problem or the other. These disciples could see it and they did not see it and look away. I have seen they didn't see anything. The church saw it. The church didn't look away. The church didn't give excuses. The Bible says that as God taught the heart of people, that all needs were met because people were giving to the welfare post of the church. Some people, not out of coercion, not out of cajoling, they went and sold their properties. That I would rather have this need met in the life of this person. I would rather have that need met in the life of this person than for me to keep this. It's of no use. If my brother is suffering, if my sister is suffering, if my brother is in need, if my sister is in need. And when those things were done, the Bible says there was no one that lacked anything. Were they multimillionaires? No. But they did not lack. They did not beg. And the world around them, looking at them, seeing the way they manifested love and showed care. And it was genuine and it was unfeigned. They knew that they had something different from what they had. And so it was easy for them to do what? To add themselves unto them. May the Lord help us in the mighty name of Jesus. I must say this. Especially, where in, especially in the area of welfare and showing love. That it must be done with caution. It must be done in the, within the bonds of love, within the bonds of prudence, and within the bonds of caution. We are living in the last days. We are living in times when there are so many false brethren. Apostle Paul talked in Jude chapter 4 of those who have crept in on our ears. To spy on our liberty, to spy on our freedom, to take advantage of our love, our care, our concern. So as a church, in ministering to the needs, in ministering to the welfare of the needy, who add themselves to us, who join us, who come to give their lives to Christ, we must what? We must exercise 
caution. We must be discerning, but we must not be deterred. We must not allow any experiences of the past, any bad experiences, any bitter of the experience of the past to deter us from doing what we should do, from closing our eyes to the needs of the, one, of the, one, of the needy ones amongst us. Many years ago, as a copper in the northern part of Nigeria, I remembered an incident which I've never forgotten. I was a member of the NCCF, and there was a pastor in that town, Pastor Luca, very anointed man of God, very friendly, very loving, very caring. Every day, every evening, we would crash in his house. Whatever was in that house, we would eat. If there was nothing to eat, we would drink water. We would have fellowship, we would play, we would do everything. And so, there was this brother, so who also, not a copper, but who, who said he gave his life to Christ and of course joined us and we welcomed him, his brother, so, 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 and things like that. At the John Shewale Ward Day. But, and when he was obviously needy, so from time to time we would give him things, the pastor would also give him clothes, we give him money, we give him food, and everybody thought he was a genuine brother. Until one day, when that pastor left him at home and went out. And the pastor's wife kept some money in the house. And before the pastor and his wife came back, this brother had taken the money, had taken their clothes, had taken several things, and bolted away. They started looking for him. Eventually, they found him where he ran to. He was not repentant. He was not remorseful. The money you took, where is it? He said he didn't answer anybody. The clothes you took, he didn't answer anybody. Eventually, they had to report him to the police. And when they reported him to the police, they started saying, ah, ah, she be Christian like we're in. Ah, ah, eh, they le fuju for now. Eh, le majeko law. Ah, ah, be, eh, de we're in loni bago. Eventually, he was prosecuted. He was jailed. It was a very bitter experience for that pastor. But I thank God for something in his life. Long suffering. That did not stop him from continuing to show Christian love. So generations upon generations of coppers continued to go to that village and he continued to show them love. He continued to open his door unto them. And I know he will not miss his reward in the mighty name of Jesus. I want to say that the end result of very positive actions in these four regards, teaching the apostles' doctrine, Fellowship, prayers, and taking care of the needs of young believers will help them to stand in the faith and not crash out. The result we find in Acts chapter 2 verse 47, the Bible says, and the church increased. The church did not decrease. The Bible says that they continued in one accord. They didn't scatter. So when we take proactive steps, to confirm the believers in the faith, what happens is that they will continue and they will not crash out. As a church, we thank God for, for the established structures and platforms we already have in place for teaching the word of God, for fellowship, for prayers, and for welfare. Thank God for our discipleship school. Thank God for our Bible study and our Bible teachings programs. Thank God for our care fellowships, the men's fellowship, the sisters' fellowship, the youth fellowship. I think we should give them a round of applause for the role they played in Jubilee Crusade 2024. They were up and doing. They were very active. Thank God for our prayer meetings. Thank God for our prayer vigils and other prayer programs. Thank God for our welfare department and all the welfare interventions by brethren in the church and by the church. However, we may need to review and reform. We may need to revive some of these structures for more impact and greater effectiveness towards ensuring that our farm fruit abide in the mighty name of Jesus. There should be capacity development. God will not give us more than what we can handle. We can pray from morning till night for growth, for increase. But our God is a good God. He's a faithful God. He will not give us more than we can handle. When our capacity is enlarged, our capacity is developed to take more, God will grant us more. May the Lord enlarge us. May the Lord make room for us in the mighty name of Jesus. But we need to develop our capacity as individual believers and as a church. Number two, there must be deployment of capable brethren to critical areas. And I know what I'm saying. 
we had to constitute a special prayer support group for Jubilee Crusade 2024 simply because some key departments, service departments, were lacking in sufficient, adequate membership. In some departments, you have more than enough people. But in some departments, you had, you know, few members. And so we know that if we are to make do with the few members in those departments, we will be overwhelmed. And we thank the Lord for the call we made and the response we got. But I want to encourage us that we should enlist as volunteers. The Bible says the harvest is plenty, but the workers, the laborers are few. And we are the laborers that God expects to move into the harvest. May we not fail in the mighty name of Jesus. There is need for deployment of capable brethren to critical areas. Number three, there must be delegation of functions in necessary cases. Brethren have been in this church for more than two decades. And I must say that even though I was already a believer before I joined this commission, when it comes to humble service, spirited service, dedicated service, relentless service, I have not met an example, I have not met a match in our senior pastor. In those days, Daddy, I'm sorry, I'll take about 10 or 15 more minutes and I'll finish. Please, I beg. In those days, before we got here to this beautiful auditorium, I remember that uh, there were many things that used to happen here. Manual labor. And so on and so forth. Daddy was senior pastor, but virtually he was a handyman. Technical department, if something was wrong there, you will find him there. Protocol, if anything was wrong, you will find him there. He was a servant leader. And he gave that as an example for each and every one of us to follow. But do you know that can you man tell on a person? When somebody gets to do too much because there are not enough people to do it, it tells on the person. And that was what Jethro told Moses. That you will weary yourself. You will die before your time if you don't learn to delegate. I want to know that the reason why it is hard to delegate is because they have, we can't find people to delegate to faithful people, reliable people. I remember that I was told that there was a particular program that was organized and that person was delegated to do something. On the day of the program, he did not show up. So when that is your experience, please, what do you do? You say, it's better I could do it than to give it to unreliable, undependable people. May God find us reliable. These are our fathers. They have served the Lord for many years, for donkey years. They have grown old in the service of the Lord. It's an aberration. Hey, help me wake that sister that is sleeping. Please help me wake her. It's an aberration. It's an aberration for us to watch our father's labor, watch our father's work, watch our father's slave, and we sit back, we enjoy everything, we are not doing anything. And so when they delegate to us, you do this, you do that, we should be willing, we should be ready to do it. May the Lord find us faithful in the mighty name of Jesus. Lastly, I want to say, that all this corporate effort of the church that I've talked about, they must be complemented by your individual effort. Your personal effort. We cannot say, yes, the church is doing it. The church, our church is powerful. Our church is mighty. Our church is moving. The spirit of God is moving. And you are not part of the move. Something is wrong. We must all pitch in. Because we are all ambassadors for Christ. We have all been given to the ministry of reconciliation. And we are all accountable to God. Daddy, when daddy was introducing this topic, mentioned Apostle Paul. Paul was a persecutor. He was injurious. He made havoc of the church. He was a terrorist. But God was bidding his time. And one day, God arrested him. We know the story. On the way to Damascus, he wanted to go and wreak havoc again. But that day, God caught him. And, of course, he surrendered his life to Christ. But do you know where I'm going? Paul the persecutor eventually became Paul the preacher. Paul 
Paul the Antichrist eventually became Paul the Apostle. But do you know that he did not become an apostle overnight? He did not become a preacher overnight. Some individual brethren, unknown, unsung, unpopular, contributed immensely to what Paul did. Number one was a man called Ananias. When Apostle Paul gave his life to Jesus Christ and he was blind, the first person that visited him was a disciple called Ananias. And what did that disciple do for him? According to the instruction of the Lord, that disciple prayed for him. And when he prayed for him, he recovered his sight. That stands for restoration. He received the Holy Spirit. That stands for strength. And was baptized in water. Every young convert, every new believer needs an Ananias. May the Lord make us that Ananias in the mighty name of Jesus. Number two, Barnabas. You remember Barnabas, the son of encouragement. When Paul became born again and he started preaching the gospel in Damascus, the Jews there wanted to kill him because they agreed, they decided that this one is a traitor. This one came to support our cause, fight our cause. He has turned against us. So they decided to kill him. Quickly they evacuated him from Damascus and he went to Jerusalem. When he, when, when he got to Jerusalem, the Christians were afraid of him because he had a reputation. They were not ready to accept him into fellowship. They were not ready to associate with him. He took Barnabas to do what? To take him and to vouch for him. This one has met the Lord. This one is a work in progress. This one is growing. This one is genuine. This one is authentic. This one is not fake. And because of the reputation and the testimony of Barnabas, the believers accepted Apostle Paul. And they accepted him as one of them. He started going in and out. He was free amongst them. Every young convert, every new believer needs a Barnabas. May the Lord find that Barnabas in us in the mighty name of Jesus. When Jerusalem got hot, very hot, for Apostle Paul. And they had to, you know, they had to uh, expatriate. What, what was your use now? They had to, you know, repatriate him to his hometown in Tassos. Because the place was too hot. They wanted to kill him. He went to Tassos and everybody forgot him there. Everybody forgot him. The church in Jerusalem, the Bible says the church in Jerusalem had rest throughout the region. So, the, the, the persecutor, the troublemaker, the troubleshooter has been converted. We are free at last. We can heave a sigh of relief. But they forgot him there. But Barnabas is not forgetting him. Right in Antioch, the Bible says that Barnabas went to Tassos and went and picked him and brought him to Antioch and they started working together. It was while working together that Apostle Paul received that call that he should do what? He should be a missionary to the Gentiles. The rest is history. Let's rise on our feet. My prayer this morning is that God will grant unto us the great grace corporately and individually to bear abundant fruits and abiding fruits in the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to take time to pray this morning. I don't know what you have picked from my long message. But I think you should take time to thank God for counting you worthy, for calling you, for choosing you to be abiding fruit. Open your mouth and pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, I want to thank you. Pray. Thank God. The Bible says many are called, but few are chosen. But you have a privilege. You are called and you are also chosen to be a fruit and to be abiding fruits. Go ahead and appreciate the Lord. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for calling me and for choosing me to be abundant fruits and to be abiding fruits. Blessed be your name in Jesus' name. Go ahead and pray that prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank and bless you. We praise and appreciate you. Lord, for the grace upon us, for calling us, for choosing us to be abiding fruits and for our fruits, Lord, to be abundant. Blessed be your name in the mighty name of Jesus. The Bible says that he that winneth soul is wise. So it takes wisdom, it takes grace to win souls. It takes grace to bear fruit and for those fruits to abide. Lift your hands to heaven and say, Heavenly Father, grant unto us the grace and the wisdom for greater effectiveness in soul winning, 
In the mighty name of Jesus, go ahead and pray that prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you grant unto us the grace and wisdom to be effective soul winners in the mighty name of Jesus, to abound in every good work, in every good fruit, in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. The Bible says that Paul planted Apollo waters, but it is God that gives the increase. The Bible says that he that plants and he that waters are one. But and every man shall receive his reward of the Lord. You are going to receive your reward though. I will receive my reward. I want to pray for yourself. Heavenly Father, as I labor in soul winning, in bearing fruits, may I not lose my reward. Go ahead and pray that prayer. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise and appreciate you for this atmosphere of your presence. We thank you for calling us and choosing us to bear abundant and abiding fruits. Lord, this is a holy calling. This is a special calling. We are thankful. We are grateful for it. Be thou exalted in Jesus' name. Lord, as a church, we ask you grant unto us the grace and wisdom for greater effectiveness in soul winning efforts as individuals and corporately in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Heavenly Father, grant us the grace to plant and to water well for divine increase and abundant fruitfulness in soul winning in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. We pray, Lord, that as we labor to win souls, as we labor to establish them in Christ, grant unto us success and enduring testimonies in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. We pray for these fruits, these precious fruits, the Lord, you will perfect all that concerns their faith in the mighty name of Jesus and cause them to stand perfect and complete in all the will of God in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, as we continue to plow, as we continue to labor, as we continue to sow, we pray that you provide for all that we need to nurture these souls in faith to become what you have ordained them to be in the mighty name of Jesus. May they grow up to be pillars in your house. May they grow up to be faithful followers of the Lord in the mighty name of Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that you will remember our labors. You will remember, Lord, our works. And you will reward them accordingly in the name of Jesus. Thank you because we know what we have asked for you will do for us. For in Jesus' mighty name, we are praying.